All right. All right. All right. Greetings, everyone. Uh, welcome back for the next Improvement Academy session and actually our very last one. Uh, as you know, this was a 12 part series. And uh, for those that, you know, certainly stuck around, thank you so much. And um, and asking all of your great questions along the way. Uh, we're, we're going to uh, now start um, with a guest uh, presenter here, Ann Staunton, uh, Dr. Staunton, uh, with our quality department here at Contra Costa Regional Medical Center. And she's got a presentation associated with faster psychiatric admit turnaround times. And uh, really, uh, and I, I turn it over to you, okay? All right, thanks, Roberto. Hi, everyone. I'm Ann Staunton. I'm on the SPI team supporting the psychiatry department, both psychiatric emergency services and inpatient psychiatry, as well as the medical ED and QIP and other projects. And I want to tell you about this project to improve um, admission turnaround times for psychiatric patients who are admitted from the PES to an inpatient psychiatry unit. Uh, we have 43 inpatient psych beds on units 4C and 4D in the hospital, all for adults. And tell you a little bit about why this was a good project and what the data measures are. So faster admit turnaround times for psychiatric units is important for hospital flow. This benefits patients to get into an inpatient setting more quickly and to decompress and decongest the PES, where crowding can lead to more assaults or just lack of safety for both staff and other patients, and also to get them in the right setting with more services, more intensive services, and also to maximize the utilization of our inpatient psychiatry beds, which is important financially also for the hospital. So the key measure is, um, the outcome measure is the bed request in, inpatients, in PES for an inpatient psych bed, which is requested by the uh, psychiatrist, to uh, the turnaround time from that to the 4C4D admit time. And in 2022, it, the baseline data showed uh, a med uh, 360 median minutes, and there's no um, like joint commission or CMS um, benchmark for this. So we did an experimental internal target of less than or equal to 320 median minutes. Um, we had a bunch of I had a bunch of other um, measures. Um, but the main ones I want to talk with you about today are that one, that's the outcome measure, as well as a process measure, which is um, the length of stay in PES, that's from arrival to departure for those admitted patients. It's important for the state uh, regulatory requirements and other reasons to minimize that length of stay, hopefully below 24 hours. Another measure that I had, which was the balancing measure, was, you know, kind of looking for what might be a good balancing measure was if we admitted too quickly or filled up too many beds, maybe you could have an increase in the assault rate on inpatient psych units. So that was my balancing measure. Um, the assault rate per um, 1,000 inpatient days on the inpatient psych units. And so I did, um, what else do I want to tell you about this? So I involved, um, of course, the psych leadership team. Um, they were so great. We, we really have a great team. They're very involved. But also the inpatient nursing uh, director of operations, Ira Beta Sabio, who leads the a medical center supervisor team, and they're the ones who do bed planning and bed assignments in the hospital. Um, Frontline also involved PES and inpatient psych charge nurses and leads who really had good ideas and psychiatrists with their ideas about, you know, delays and flow. Um, to get started, the next one, as you can see, sometimes mapping the process of something can be very complicated, and I'm sure I could have 
streamlined this even more, but it shows you all the different steps that are involved from the start to the end. Um, now, because 4C4D are only adults who meet inpatient psych admission criteria, those are the target patients. Those are the inclusion right criteria. So I started with them. And then you go around clockwise to all the blue squares and see the different steps. And the yellow stars call out the delays that we identified together in a team, in multiple team meetings, actually. And um, it's kind of complex because patients can be referred out to outside hospitals uh, based on different criteria, insurance, um, acuity, um, many different criteria. These include adults and also all the minors, of course, because minors 17 and younger do not get admitted to our 4C4D units. So there's sometimes a little bit of back and forth um, looking for an outside bed, let's say, uh, at another hospital or unit, while also considering would the patient go up to 4C4D, and that can lead to delays. Other delays um, is the right bed, is the right bed available? So we have shared rooms uh, in 4C4D, so it needs to be a male or female bed or a, a single bed. Uh, patient, in other words, no roommate, if the patient's super acute with a uh, risk for assault or other reasons. And then within that, some patients need medical beds if they're frail, if they have fall risk, and there aren't that many medical beds on 4C and 4D. And I'll share with you in the next slide that we identified that as, um, as a bottleneck to address. Um, also communicating with the MCS, there's a lot of communication back and forth with them about um, ensuring that they know a bed has been requested, even though that's in CC Link. The MCS team, they're very, very busy. Uh, they go around to all the units doing rounds all day, and they're seldom at their computers. So we wanted to make sure that they were, all their phones were the smartphones with the bed alerts. Uh, in other words, when there's a new bed request, it would alert on their phone. And then they can sign into a computer at whichever unit they're in. Um, also, um, inpatient psychiatry has staffing ratios for the nurses, and so sometimes there might be delays if there weren't enough nurses to meet the ratio. And the nursing team, the leaders, really came up with some creative things to send a float up from PES to make sure that the ratio is met in order not to delay uh, those uh, admits after the bed was assigned. Um, other things that might happen, there might be a change in condition down here in this star. Um, if a new lab is needed or a patient is restrained and or secluded in PES and it needs another doctor, a psychiatrist evaluation to determine if, determine if the patient's ready to go up. And then they need all their labs, their belongings labs, including um, COVID-19 PCR negative within 48 hours most recently. So these are some of the different things before a patient will eventually go upstairs and um, will be escorted up by what's called, uh, we call our assist team, which is assist team code gray. And they assist with the primary nurse bringing the patient up to 4C4D. Um, so looking at the driver diagram, these were some of the changes that we identified based on looking at um, the process, the flow, the delays, and some different ideas that we had. And the dark blue, um, items were implemented in March to May 2023. So several of these, and we can talk about them. And then the green were the new was a new one that was implemented July to October 23. And the orange um, more recently in 2023, later in 2023. And the gold was just right here, over here, it's kind of yellow actually, was that we realized we needed to add a few medical beds to 4D to address that bottleneck. And that May Torres, the NPM has been working on that. That takes quite a while to happen. So we talked about, you know, hospital flow um, is a combination of capacity. That's the number of beds. So in theory, there's 43, right, between the two units. But how many um, 
are really available at a given date and time depend on a lot of factors. They depend on whether those patients that are already in those beds have, um, you know, a discharge plan, a placement, how long their length of stay is. And so Matthew Liu, who is our new um, uh, director or chief on the administrative and social services side, who really knows BHS and worked there for many years, really coordinated with BHS on placements, especially for our extended stay patients, to make sure that we could get them out of there and open up um, beds more quickly. Um, the other project was nursing worked with psychiatrists, this is the green one, to um, open up capacity, if you want to think about it that way, or flow by um, reviewing more frequently what are called bed blocks. So traditionally, the MCS would assign a bed block. In other words, a no roommate order. Usually it's for a patient at risk of assault, but it could be for construction. It could be for an infection, um, for any reason why that patient needs to be alone in that, in that room. But uh, in the past, those bed blocks might be on for hours or even days. Um, and they do require a doctor's order, so an inpatient psychiatrist order. But we came up with a system where the psychiatrist agreed to certain guidelines where the charge nurses would review those bed blocks every single shift and try to determine if the patient met criteria according to these guidelines to open up that bed. So in other words, opening up more beds opens up more flow, which allows more patients to be admitted upstairs. Um, other things... Um, are mentioned here, but I'm not really going to talk about them. We, I alluded to the smartphone alerts. We also had um, earlier COVID PCR swabbing, and then some projects that the social workers and um, the whole team were involved in. And so I started out with run charts for the for the measures, and I'm just focusing on three measures I did. I think it was six to eight measures for my project, but I'll show you one of each uh, type. Well, I'll show you one process measure, which I talked about, which was the median length of stay hours in the PES for calendar year 2022. So it was a total of um, 29.5 median LOS hours for the whole year. And this is how the run chart looked um, with the median, according to the run chart of 29.98. Um, whoops, how did I do that? Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, and then also run charts for each of the other measures that I'm going to talk about, which the outcome measure was the bed request to the inpatient psych admin turnaround time, which was 360 median minutes for the whole year. And this is how it varied throughout the year. And then the same thing for the assault rate, um, doing the number of assaults, um, divided by the number of inpatient days times 1,000 for a rate per 1,000 inpatient days. And it was 34 assaults on staff with a rate of 3.8 per 1,000 inpatient days and a median here in this run chart of 3.16. I just want to mention about median. Of course, um, it might really jump out at you that median hour, median minutes, like 320 um, for my target, that means, or let's say for the, sorry, for the baseline, 360, that means that half of all the admissions, which are like about, it was almost, it was seven, 660 admits in 2022, had a turnaround time of less than 360 minutes, and half of them had more. So obviously, as we got more into this project, we wanted to even improve this even more. But median minutes and median median hours is a standard approach to this kind of measure, a cycle time measure. And then we did some PDSAs, um, and they had mixed um, effects on reducing turnaround times that I'll show you in our measures. So I talked about the one with the bed block reviews and edits, and I had a few different measures that I looked at. And while it didn't have an impact on what I thought it, what we thought it would, which was the percent of mon monthly bed block days, but it did help with other things to 
reduce the turnaround time from bed request to admin to 4 C4D. And it was also a priority for nursing leadership to keep this project going. So we did, and we continue to look at it. For this one, um, we've been working together as a team to standardize and share what the admit guidelines are so that it's really clear. Um, and we've worked, we worked on um, a few different tests. And again, that test on, on its own didn't demonstrate that that alone would, you know, reduce the turnaround times, but it together with other factors did, includes, including the factors related to capacity. So we continued that work and we continued to refine it as well in 2024. Some of my charts for the different measures. This one is that process measure for the median length of stay hours in PES. Um, again, some of the enhancements that I talked about were focus on the extended, focus on more capacity on the inpatient side bed side. So that means getting patients out more quickly and discharged so that you have more beds available to admit into. That work started in May. We also had the bed block review and edit project that started in July. And then we had additional projects done by social services and more modification regarding admit rules, um, softer or flexible admissions that still meet requirements um, specifically related to SUD as a um, comorbid condition that if you if the psychiatrist um, is confident that the psychiatric diagnosis is primary, but the patient is clearing from a substance in the past, they would clear completely in PES, and this would lead to longer time in PES, whereas now there's some flexibility to be able to admit the patient upstairs if safe. So those that showed a nice decrease here, and this is a control chart called an X chart, and the control limit, which is the mean shifted from 37 median length of stay hours to 25. And it's even gone down since then. I have more data. I continue to collect this data in 2024. Um, now, this is the outcome measure, which is the bed request to the inpatient psych admit turn, uh, turnaround time in median minutes. And this one is also an X chart. And it shows you a lot of different interventions that we talked about. And the control limit went from 747 uh, minutes to 333.7, and it continues to drop down. And in 2024 years to date, we're on track with um, under 320 median minutes, and we continue to work on it. This one, assaults on staff um, rate, um, this shows you some variation, but overall, um, this is a, called a U chart with a control limit of 2.4 and a target of two or below. Um, the baseline was 2.8, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I even move my mouse around, it sort of shifts me off. Here we go. Um, so the target was, let's think for a second. It was, oh, okay, the baseline was 2.8 per thousand inpatient days and the follow-up with 34 total assaults on staff and the rate in the follow-up period, which was May 2023 to April 24, was 1.8 per 1,000 inpatient days and 23 assaults. This shows an improvement, not an increase. So therefore, the worry that it would increase didn't come to pass. So that's a good thing. The balancing measure um, was satisfied. And then this is more detail of weekly um, for the outcome data. And we would look at that together and try to understand any outliers and work together um, as a team to kind of test where we were. And then sort of the summary, um, it showed an improvement in the turnaround times um, from a baseline of 360 median minutes in 2022 to 276 median minutes in the 12 months ending April 2024, and even improved since then. And several process measures also showed improvement, uh, the ones listed here. 
including the one I showed you, which was the length of stay hours in PES for those admitted patients. And then I talked about a few of the tests of change that we did. And then we had different process enhancements that together probably contributed to the favorable declines. The MCS bed request alerts on smartphones. We had um, a really great streamlined and redesigned PES inpatient psych nursing handoff note template in the electronic health record. They were still doing paper and faxing up stairs, <laughs> if you can believe it, up until February 2023. And the nurses love it, and it works really well. And um, MCS department nursing text group. So this is an, the MCF, MCS and the nur nurse program managers and the charge nurses are all on this text group about admits, you know, of there's two eligible to go upstairs, this one's more acute, the psychiatrist wants this one to go first. Or we're not meeting ratio on 4C, Who who's going to talk with the staffing office to make sure we can send up a floater to meet that ratio and when's the patient going up, things like that. Um, placement work that I mentioned to you to increase the capacity on the inpatient psych uh, floors. And streamlined PES social worker approval process for referring out versus admitting to for C4D, and then some softer admit criteria. And as I mentioned, the balancing measure didn't demonstrate a concerning negative impact. Um, and the keys to success, you know, psychiatry is really a multidisciplinary team uh, with um, psychiatrists, um, also Department of Hospital Medicine um, physicians that are assigned to do medical HMPs and consults. We have um, a nursing team, of course, nurses, social workers, mental health clinical specialists. We even have occupational therapists on inpatient site, as well as clerks and others who play a role in the daily work. Um, escalating issues as they arise to solve them. We had a lot of work together on that. And of course, Ira being really helpful in our meetings um, to kind of get that communication together with any guidelines that we we all agreed on with the MCS team and the psychiatry department. Some different tools that were helpful, the process map and the driver diagram. And also we would review and audit very long turnaround time cases together. There's so many complex factors that contribute to that. And so we would review them and look at different factors and try to um, discuss those cases together. And then some of the barriers that bed availability at CCRMC and outside facilities is hard to control. Um, that's been, you know, a chronic factor, not only in our region, but, you know, in, throughout the state and the nation in terms of availability for step-down beds and long-term locked psychiatric beds. Um, those contribute to longer stays and to slower flow. But I think we've made a difference in the flow. Um, let's see. Also, time to devote to the project can always, always be a challenge when you have um, more important issues that come up, crises, patient care needs, right, that come up. And um, bed guidelines, you know, there's a lot of discussion there. And sometimes we didn't reach consensus. And we had spent a lot of time on it, but we learned through it and we, we moved on. But one thing I also didn't add here, but as an important step in a sort of a success factor is translating this, uh, whatever we're doing for staff, so they understand how to maintain and sustain changes. Um, so for example, we built in eyesight, um, this place within eyesight, um, a certain uh, report that has tabs, it's a dashboard um, that shows the weekly data for all the different measures. And so all the staff have to do is look there and um, tips for them, like how many minutes or hours after a bed is assigned do they have to start escalating if the patient's still in PES. Another thing that's really going to be great to watch and help the team with this year is that the, N the PES NPM and her charge nurses, um, Ngazi MN alum and her charge nurses decided to take a component of this that we really didn't work on um, in, a tar in a pointed way, in a structured way. And that is the time from when the bed is assigned to when the patient leaves the PES. And so they're gonna work on that improvement project. And I hope we it will lead to even more reduction in turnaround times together.
So that's all I have. Um, did anyone have any questions for me or? Yeah, so um, I'll definitely say more thanks later, Anne, but thank you right now for definitely presenting such a, I would say, masterful project. Um, I got one for you. So this this group of, of folks have been learning about what it takes to facilitate performance improvement. And um, some of you all are maybe uh, further along than others, but just kind of at a foundational level, I'm wondering, so you as kind of facilitating PI, what did it take to bring a team together to be this kind of oriented towards this methodology? Yeah, I think just breaking it down into terms and framework that everyone can understand to start with and then building towards understanding what the measures are. So I think it almost like you have to start with, well, what's the problem? Um, what's the problem as they see it? And what's the enhancement? So when people began to understand the flow problem, which they all recognize and they see in their day-to-day -day mm -hmm. life, and it's very frustrating for staff and for patients, then it was, oh, okay, um, what are some of the delays? And how can we turn studying those delays into, hey, what's um, an idea to address that delay or that barrier, like an improvement? And then building from there, oh, okay, so then, you know, and, and so there's a higher ownership, I think, when you build it that way. Because these are, when you start getting into the measures and the language of PI that is very um, measurement focused, I think it can be a little bit alienating to the clinical teams that aren't used to that. And then I think, you know, um, just open-ended um, brainstorming about the different causes of the delays in the process is really a great way to start. And we did that in different ways. And we could have done even more of that. And I'm looking forward to observing how they do it in this new project. Um, you know, like different tools like Roberto that you've used with them, you know, the post-it notes or mm -hmm. the... Um, summarizing brainstorming in different ways is a really great way for them to like own it yeah. and then refine it and then pick the best candidates for an improvement idea. Awesome. You know, I was going to ask if other people have other question, but I, I think my next question was actually exactly where you, where you ended there, which was how did, it sounds like there was a number of interventions you had done. How did you select which one you wanted to do first or in what order? You know, that was really organic because when we first started talking about it, that just came up right away. Like May told me, oh my gosh, yeah, we're doing this text group. I didn't even know about it. I had asked about the uh, alerts on the phones. I had asked Ira and then he surprised us with, well, they don't all have it. So let's get them on that. So it was pretty organic that we were, we kind of came up with similar ideas to start first that were, I feel like we're low, low hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. um, and then where we went from there was really based on what the team thought. I know that there had been a separate discussion in nursing leadership about the bed block uh, reviews, but it lined up perfectly with our project. I, I don't know how they came up with it. I think they separately were concerned that there were too many patients uh, with bed blocks for days and days and days that weren't changed because in the past only the MCS could remove the bed block. So at first we thought, well, let's just get the nurse, charge nurses trained to use it. It's called the unit manager to use this and have the, you know, access to edit the bed blocks. Mm -hmm. And then it turned into more because the psychiatrist ultimately is responsible for the patient, including their safety. And the psychiatrist had to agree. So it became a more elaborated, like set of guidelines. Okay, if a patient hasn't assaulted in X number of days, or if these criteria are met, then uh, the charge nurse can remove the bed block. You see what I mean? Yeah. Because wow. we don't, we didn't want a patient to be unsafe. Uh, you know that, uh, and the right patient has to be roomed in with the with the patient. That's the other thing, mm -hmm. who might be at risk. So there's a lot of art to this maybe more outside the science <laughs> in all of this, like a lot of qualitative factors. Sure, sure. And and to recognize, uh, I know you have a team you've worked together for uh, with for years now. And so you've got this kind of 
formality kind of set and um, that organic nature seems to work well for you all with people very interested and motivated to make things better. So that's great. Um, all right, any questions for the, from the audience? Uh, feel free to pepper a hand. Um, I had a question. So I understand that the flow is like the main issue when you are starting this project, but is there a certain situation or instance that like actually spread it on or how did you decide exactly like this is the time that this needs to change? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. So separately in PES for about three or four years, um, we've been implementing many different projects to reduce crowding there because crowding in PES and length of stay are their own separate problems that we've needed to address. And so this project came up because it would help address that as well as maximize utilization of our inpatient psych beds. That's really kind of one of the reasons that it became urgent or important to do it. Uh, and question from the audience, what does MCS stand for? Oh, it's a medical center supervisor. It's an RN who plays the role in the hospital of bed, what's called bed planning. So from the medical ED up to the inpatient medical floors and from the PES to the inpatient psych units, they um, work with the uh, requesting or um, approving, admitting physicians to uh, pick the unit and the bed and assign the beds. And this, this is all done in CC link, but it's also done in conversation and patients need to meet acuity requirements for that admission. Great. I, I like to think of them as the air traffic controller of beds for the, at the hospital. So <laughs> yeah. but patients are going where? <laughs> yeah. Runway. Right. Okay. Um, anyone else? Okay. okay, maybe that might be it, Anne. Okay, that's all right with me. <laughs> uh -huh. Perfect. All right, well, well, again, Anne, thank you so much for joining us and, and presenting your project. Uh, wealth of work there um, and, and knowledge gained. Um, any any uh, maybe, maybe last tips you might want to share with the group as, again, uh, they're in this state of beginning PI, they're... Um, We've learned about the various charters and driver diagrams and everything, but anything you might want to suggest um, how to kick off a product the, the right way? Yeah, I think start small, think about low hanging fruit, pick something that seems feasible and people are engaged with, and then go from there. You'll learn how to use the tools. You'll hopefully make progress or you'll learn if you don't and you can eliminate that idea and then move on to the next one or build on it. Absolutely, build on it, okay. Yeah. All right, thanks a lot, Roberto, yeah. for inviting me. Absolutely. And good Very luck, good. everyone. All right, thanks, Anna. All right, bye-bye. Bye. Okay, everybody. So we're at that tail end of, our, again, session 12, and um, I wanna make sure we got some good engagement here. So I, I wanna maybe do a quick little challenge of questions. Um, so we've heard this term PDSA a number of times. Um, someone, someone tell me what that means real quick. Not only the acronym, but what is it, what does each um, acronym or piece of acronym letter mean? Like your final exam. Feeler, come on, what's going on? Oh, Sarah, what did, um, Yes, PDSA, Plan, Do, Study, Act. Awesome. Does, um, if you don't have a mic, that's okay, but can you describe what, what each of those components mean? Oh. Well. Thank you. Oh. Oh, there you go. Go yeah. ahead. I'll take a stab at it. Um, so the plan part is really like what, I guess, exactly what it says, like planning the actions that you'll be doing within the first cycle. Mm -hmm. um, the do is the the steps, I guess, that are going to be, 
the actionable mm -hmm. stuff. Yep. Uh, the study is essentially the outcomes from the steps that you took action in, in the do part. Is that a good way to, yeah, okay. And then act, um, I always understood that as kind of like from the findings from the study part is like mm -hmm. how, you, how you're going to move forward, like the actions from that. Yeah. And it, I know it gets a little bit more com complicated from there, but I I like to say there's there's three different decisions when you get into the act part of things. You can uh, adapt, adopt, abandon. Okay, so you you can adapt your your project. So meaning you didn't exactly achieve the outcome you wanted, but then you can tweak a few things and then try it again and see if you do get that outcome. So adapting, uh, adopting. That as to say, hey, I love the outcome. It's exactly what I what I thought would happen, and I I achieved my goal, full scale. Let's 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 maybe try it one more time just to ensure that it wasn't a fluke. And potentially, um, if when you get to a point of yes, this is this is definitely tested, and I can start maybe spreading this to another site if there's different sites that could take advantage of this this trial, and then abandon, just complete opposite. I, I I did not hit my goal completely wrong. Uh, it's not worth even trying again or exploring this idea. Let's just let's just leave it and and move on. But thank you so much. Thank you. All right, another question. Um, so with let's let's go over to um, the model. So we talked about the model and overall. Now it's gonna it's gonna mirror a lot of the of PDSA. But remember, we talked about there's various models that exist, right? And um, I likened it to uh, the scientific method. So what uh, roughly, uh, it's going to be like similar like PDSA, but what's roughly what you're trying to do on the very beginning of a project, according to the model? And I'm going to focus there. What's that? What's the first things that you want to achieve when you start a project? Identify the problem. Exactly. Yes. I, if, if there's um, whatever of, of a handful of things that I want to convey to this group of folks here, um, always start with the problem, right? Why do you even want to kind of bother, waste your time? Why do you want to invest time in working on this problem or this area of work? So that's where you, you have to really figure out what are the why, why, whys of what's happening? What's really, really happening here? And you're asking, since oh, there's a bunch of techniques that we walk through, you know, talking to people, looking at data, certainly um, if there's some sort of oversight that you have, um, your supervisor, your supervisor's supervisor who maybe challenged you with this work, really understanding why did they bring it to your attention? Because only then can you really start figuring out, okay, let me ask more questions. Who can I ask further about this? And only at that stage of you know what's truly the problem, can you really start figuring out different ideas that you might want to test? So uh, you know, and I and I know, we, you probably all experienced uh, someone saying, hey, I know what's the solution to that problem, like from the, from the get-go. And it could very well be right. But by doing that, you're you're hurtling over, well, what's truly the cause? What's what's actually the reason for that problem existing? And might there be some other um, uh, directly uh, affiliated things that should be considered as far as, oh, if we if I would have thought about this other pathway more, maybe that's actually the reason why this problem exists and what maybe we should we do about it? Thank you, thank you, yes. Um, how about, let me one more question here. Um, what's the difference between a process map and a value stream map? Not easy. <laughs> process map, value stream map. Nicole, you got something? I see your hand now. Okay, the process map 
how things actually work operationally, where, whereas the value stream map is where the the value is in it, the bang for the buck? Yeah, I would say you're you definitely are incorporating what the client um, deems as valuable um, into yeah. this map. Um, and remember, uh, there are three layers to that map, if you remember right. And that middle layer is essentially a process map. But there's other layers, top and bottom, that talk about communication and talk about time. So what a process map for sure, like the way that to really differentiate, you would say, well, one is process map, step, arrow, step, arrow, whereas the value stream map really adds in the component of time. How long does each step take? How much time is between each step, which we, we might consider as a waste. And then each step can be further refined or not. So I, I while there are three sort of areas, the way I typically say how to really differentiate step, arrow, step versus step, arrow, step plus time. We're actually calculating how much time is going on throughout the process. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Um, I'll stop there with my questions, but really now turning to you for a separate question. Um, we're at the end here. This is this is it. This is the final thing. Any outstanding pieces of information that anyone wants to hear about, or um, you're even welcome to even provide feedback um, on this experience. <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely curious to hear what anyone has to say. Well, I know I already spoke a little bit earlier, but I was I really appreciated. I didn't get to go to every single session. I think there's um a couple of them that I would probably still need to watch the recordings, but I really appreciated having the recordings just in case for, you know, vacation or whatever. Um, but being able to go back to also look at some of the um just the things that we talked about, the topics. And I know we went through a ton of different kind of like tools and diagrams that um, I was introduced to first through this um, through this improvement academy, um, and so it, I think it really helped kind of build my tool set. I work um, in quality and safety, so I, I take on a lot of improvement projects in my portfolio. A lot of them are smaller, but um, I think just having just learning and being introduced to some of these topics and theories has been really helpful. Fantastic, and um, didn't realize uh, another buddy in quality and safety. Uh, which, which, where are you located at? Um, I work at 2500 Bates, so I'm with Cut Across the Health, so the, our, our public health department. Yeah. Awesome. Well, um, now that we know each other, you're feel free to welcome and, you know, ask me questions. Um, I'm happy to uh, side conversations on this stuff, too. Well, thank you. But yes, I really appreciated the conversations and getting to also learn a little bit about some of the projects, other people, and how they could apply these, you know, these ideas or topics. So Perfect. Perfect. thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Questions, concerns, feedback? I have some feedback. Yeah. Hi. Hey. <laughs> Let me turn on my camera here. Um, yeah, so for me, um, I've talked to you, I've talked to you outside of the academy, but I've I haven't been able to go to every session, mm -hmm. but to the sessions that I have been to, I really appreciate how you go into detail and and explain it in a way to where we understand it. <laughs> well, at least I understand it. Um, and so I really appreciate that because it's sometimes it's really difficult to understand this, especially on the first time, right? It's a lot of information. Um, so anyways, I just really like the way you explain things and, um, the way that you take your time with it. Thank you for that. I oh, appreciate it. Thank you. And definitely feel free to again, reach out, ask more questions. I'm, I'm happy to provide it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right. If no other, uh, takers, um, I think we've got 10 minutes left in the hour, but, uh, just want to say again, thank you for all your participation and joining on this uh, twelve-part series, long, a long haul. Um, uh, shout out to uh, Miss Williams here, who has been our uh, everything uh, manager coordinator of this whole whole show, and um, 
I, and I know uh, a shout out to uh, Erica, who I know couldn't couldn't speak during the session, but for a little message here of appreciation. And uh, she helped to, uh, of course, set this platform and make this uh, something to actually happen. So again, shout out and big thank yous. So uh, again, I guess we'll, we'll say signing off. And um, if there's something else that pops up, you know, maybe a future something, we'll let you we'll let you all know. But again, you have the recordings until then and, and my contact information to reach out. Thank, Thank you, you Roberta. Take care, everybody.